Good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll allow a minute or two for people to join and then we'll start. Thank you. Um, we are expecting a few more people to join, so we'll allow maybe one more minute and then we'll stop. Okay, I think um, a lot of people have joined by now, so um, I'll, I'll start here. So uh, good morning, everyone, again, and thanks for joining this webinar, uh, which will be talking about National Grid's project called Approach for Long-Term Planning Accounting for Carbon Assessment, or ALPACA in short. So um, I think most of the presenters will be referring it to, to as ALPACA, so please get used to that. Um, so my name is Lisa Troshka, I'm Innovation Engineer with National Grid and um, Electricity Distribution side of National Grid, and I was a project manager for this project. So I'll quickly run through the plan for today, agenda, a few practicalities, and uh, hand it over to my colleagues from ACOM and National Grid and SPAN uh, to talk about technical aspects and uh, other bits that we've done through this project. So um, here you could see the agenda, what we're hoping to cover. So what I'll do, I'll quickly introduce the project and the reasoning for commencing it. Uh, and then our colleagues from ACOM will run you through um, how they've developed the whole life carbon management framework and uh, various uh, carbon databases and tools that support that vision. And we're quite lucky today to be joined by Jill Russell from National Grid and Steve Valance from uh, Scottish Power Energy Networks to provide their thoughts and considerations how the outputs of the alpaca could be um, integrated into business as usual and provide a wider industry perspective of why it's important. And I think um, uh, they, they would also mention the new requirements for more rigorous scope three carbon reporting as well. 
Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end. So if you do have a question, please submit it through the Q&A button that you could see. Hopefully everyone can see it at the bottom of your screen. Um, there is an option to vote for questions. So what I'll do at the end, I'll prioritize the question with most of the votes and try to direct it to the right person to answer. Um, so I think um, this is it from me on this sort of agenda and practicality. So we'll start here. So um, Project Alpaca started last year, the beginning of last year, and it took us around 15 months to complete it. And um, the main thing that we're trying to achieve is to um, to be in a position to um, have a better understanding of what um, capital impact our capital schemes have and uh, understand what those carbon hotspots are to be able to see where are the opportunities to reduce our carbon footprint. And um, we, when we started the project, we kind of realized, and I think others will touch on it a bit later, is that um, there is quite a lot of data gaps with respect to sort of um, equipment carbon emission factors. Um, to allow us to do an accurate carbon reporting. So what we're trying to do is to come up with those, um, to come up with the uh, emission factors that will allow us to um, robustly report our footprint going forward. So like I mentioned, it took around 15 months to complete this project. It was funded through um, network innovation allowance mechanisms and um, the budget you see on the screen was roughly to um, 140,000 um, pounds. So the project was delivered in collaboration with ACOM who provided their technical expertise in um, carbon reporting and also we had we were quite lucky to have span with us um, um steve specifically to to act sort of like a very fire and uh, be able to feedback on our progress and um also I, I suppose steve will touch on it as well he's got a role within ena he's the chair of uh, carbon working group so he had a good understanding what's happening what needs to happen and um, hopefully we'll touch on that a bit later. So now I'll hand, hand over to you, Hayley, um, if that's okay. Yeah, thanks Lisa. Um, so I guess the aim of the project or, or our task was to develop a whole life carbon management framework um, in conjunction with National Grid and then build that into a, a bespoke tool that can be embedded into existing business processes and systems um, and aligned with um, National Grid's asset management system for distribution. Um, so we broke that down into 40, 40 tasks, um, a literature review, stakeholder engagement, um, development of the whole life carbon management framework itself, and then um, working with our digital team and um, the development of the tool itself. So I guess within the, the literature review, um, we looked at some of the external requirements um, around carbon carbon and government legislation, regulations, policy um, across the UK, as well as some of the ambitions for the power sector um, in terms of decarbonisation targets and kind of the journey through to net zero in 2050, um, to kind of build some of the, the backstory and the reason for, for the project. Um, we then pulled on kind of references on best practice in terms of standards and specifications for whole life carbon counting and reporting. Um, which mainly mainly focused around um, PAS 2080 um, and the, the carbon management framework for in infrastructure there. And finally, um, we reviewed some of the existing off the shelf um, tools and emission factor databases um, that are available on the market to kind of see if there was anything already out there that, there that could be either used already um, as it is by National Grid or kind of tailored um, to, to be a bit more bespoke um and i guess our kind of main finding out of that is that whilst there are some great tools out there such as one click and e-tool um there was nothing that could be quite tailored to, to the power sector or directly tailored to national grid's existing asset management system um to align with the, the products and the materials that they are are using in in design um so then we moved forward into kind of the stakeholder engagement phase um, 
um, engagement was conducted over about a four month period um, across a series of, of teams um, within National Grid to kind of really get an understanding of the existing kind of business processes um, in terms of product design, project design, build, operation, um, as well as the reporting requirements in terms of carbon reporting, um, sustainability agendas, um, but also potentially wider uses of the tool in terms of being able to compare um, compare project designs and lessons learned between um, innovation projects. So, so yeah, as I said, we kind of engaged with the environment team, project design teams, um, data teams, innovation, um, a whole host of, of teams to kind of get a, a very clear vision in terms of what we wanted to achieve and what existing data sets and processes we needed to, to align with. Um, we also, as part of that, engaged with some of the wider DNOs um, through presenting on one of the the ENA workshops kind of give other um, companies in the sector a bit of an overview as to what the project is about, um, kind of gauge their their kind of process on this journey as well, and um, how this project could could benefit not only um, National Grid energy distribution but also um, the wider the wider sector. Um, and and this kind of also gave us a, a good space for testing concepts. Um, in terms of methodology and usability before we actually embark on the tool development itself. Uh, so then we, we moved forward and kind of documented, I suppose, the whole life carbon methodology that we were going to use. Um, and that kind of outlines the structure and the underlying calculation methodology and the processes for embedding that into, into the business, um, both for the, the reporting tool and the carbon database itself, but also kind of how how the process can be integrated into existing business processes because no matter how good a, a tool is or the data sets behind it if it isn't implemented um, within policy in a business and um, you're not going to drive forward the change that, that needs to happen to, to hit net zero um, and then building building on all of all three past state we worked with acom's internal digital team um, to actually bring this vision to life and We've developed a, so an offline Excel based tool, um, but enabling users to, to calculate um, whole life carbon emissions at a, at a project level um, across three design stages, baseline, detailed design, and that's built. And it's backed up by a Power BI dashboard um, that enables National Grid to collectively look at, look at projects um, across the year, compare and um, analyze as, as needed for company reporting. So this slide just kind of summarises some of the key deliverables um, as part of the project. Um, the main one obviously being the, the um, Excel-based tool that will be kind of piloted over the next few months within, within National Grid. Um, and also a supplier carbon calculator to support um, National Grid in capturing embodied carbon data from, from the supply chain. So looking at some of the key materials and components that go into um, products that um, are purchased as part of the project. And uh, yeah, these were supported by documentation along the way, I guess, defining the journey of the project and how we got from, from the starting point um, in January 2022 to, to where we are today. Um, the, the literature review and the whole life carbon framework are actually publicly available. Um, through the National Grid website uh, and yeah can be can be read and digested um, at your leisure. So I'm now going to touch on kind of the, the whole life management process itself. So um, this is a key figure from the methodology document that, that can be found online and kind of trying to represent very simplistically um, the inputs and outputs of calculating whole life carbon um, for a project. So it all aligns with CAS 2080, uh, which is a publicly available specification for carbon management in the infrastructure, currently going through a, a rewrite and hopefully due to be published um, later this year. But so this graphic is from, from
from the um, initial version of, of PAS 2080, but in terms of the modular approach for calculating whole life carbon, um, I think that's that's going to remain. Um, and PAS 2080, this is, is recognised industry best practice, um, it's been endorsed by the DNO committee and the wider sector for kind of the, the approach that organisations should be taking um, when looking at, at whole life carbon. So kind of takes you through um, from a, apologies, it's probably a little bit small on the screen there, but kind of looking at the before you stage in terms of the construction and the capital build um, of a project and through to the use stage and the operational activities, um, maintenance and replacement cycles. And then FAS 2080 also looks at, at end of life um, activity and, and um, routes to disposal at the end of end of the project's life. We um, did actually exclude end of life from the, the um, whole life carbon management framework we put together for National Grid, recognising that um, a lot of their projects have a have a lifespan well in excess of kind of 60 years and it's very challenging to accurately estimate the future decommissioning impacts um so for that reason we, we've excluded it so far but any decommissioning would be kind of included within a future um projects activities as kind of part of the before use activity so um the, the cycle would continue so yeah, obviously at this stage it looks quite simple, um, kind of outlining from putting things into capital carbon um, for use through to operational and um, looking at the kind of key components of a, of a data set, calculations and then outputs. Um, but I think some of the, the challenges we had um, kind of by not choosing a bespoke, uh, sorry, a um, off the shelf solution was that when developing a bespoke solution, you've got to generate your own data um, or have a handle on your own data. So that was the, the biggest challenge, I suppose, of this project um, and something we're going to explore a little bit further. So the main aim, or one of the key reasons we selected um, developing our own tool was to align the databases underneath it as close as possible to National Grid's existing asset management system in terms of the projects and the activities that they commission. So what we did for the most part was kind of gather that data from the asset management system, um, which from a capital delivery standpoint, most data um, was already split by or generated by key activities um, that were part of the project design that could be then broken down into material labour and plant requirements um, that are required to complete the job. However, there was still a lot of work that needed to, to happen in terms of defining the carbon activity data of each of these three databases and the emission factors that would be applied in each. I mean, in, a, in an ideal world, um, all products and materials would have environmental performance declarations, um, which are, are, are badges to say kind of the carbon footprint associated with um, a, a product that you would buy from a supplier. But I think we're still a long way off um, supply chains in this industry having um, completed full life cycle assessments of their of their products. So um, in the in the interim, we had to make um, a few assumptions around some of the component materials and weights of things like um, transformers, cable, um, distribution poles and distribution wires and, and things like that, um, switch gear. So we did that through um, kind of publicly available data where it wasn't um, directly available from National Grid, kind of researched what um, EPDs we could find, um, what data was available through key supplier websites, that sort of thing. Um, and then we kind of narrowed it down to um, key materials or key components of each element that we could then look to apply emission factors for from either the inventory of carbon and energy um, database through Bath University, uh, UK government emission factors through Bayes, 
or um, as I say, where we find um, life cycle assessment figures or EPDs, we, we prefer to use those. So, yeah, and then we populated, um, so behind the tool for each asset can be selected, um, sits a database for material labour plant that builds up to um, capture that before use um, capital delivery phase of the, of the project. So then similarly um, with the through life um, operational activity, there's kind of possibly even, even less um, data here and more uncertainty, I suppose, in terms of maintenance cycles, replacement cycles, um, obviously a lot of that depends on when things break and um, external factors that can't be kind of captured in in this process but so all of this is kind of a, an estimate of um, what what is likely to happen um, so we aligned the the maintenance cycles we aligned with um, national grids existing policy in terms of just kind of ad hoc site visits annual annual maintenance that they typically do on substations and things like that and uh, we pulled averages um, on operational factors such as the electricity consumption and the SF6 loss from typical assets and those were then averaged out across um, asset groups so again we uh, grouped things into transformers, cables, um, key asset groups that were likely to have a significant um, through life emissions so, so we haven't necessarily captured everything, but we've captured the significant contribution contributors to um, a project through like carbon. So I guess, uh, as Lisa kind of highlighted a little bit earlier, and um, I've mentioned, one of the key limitations of um, kind of building a bespoke solution has been the availability of data and the appropriate emission factors, um, particularly when it comes to things like mechanical and electrical equipment. Um, I think the databases that are out there, um, the ICE database and such, they're very good for civil components of, a, um, of an infrastructure project, but when it comes to M&E and um, products that have so many different components and electrical um, components as well, uh, it's a lot more challenging unless your supply chain have already completed a life cycle assessment, uh, product footprint, um, environmental product declaration. So we wanted to um, kind of support National Grid with some simple um, ways to obtain best data in the future. Um, so we worked with the, the procurement team to develop a couple of sustainable procurement initiatives. So firstly, we engaged with the procurement team around the current supplier selection process um, and kind of what, what questions they were already asking. Um, did sustainability factor into the decisions? Um, was it completely driven by cost? And we built um, this, this carbon impact questionnaire um, to support them with some of the, the key questions that should be asked during tenders and encouraging that, that carbon and sustainability credentials were um, given a similar weighting to that cost moving forwards um, to help kind of even that balance between um, bottom line and uh, sustainability um, and carbon reduction. And then secondly, uh, we produced a simple Excel template um, that can be shared with the supply chain to capture key product information in terms of material inputs to estimate embodied carbon. So this tool isn't a full product footprint um, in any stretch of the means, but it does um, capture some of the, the hotspots in terms of the, the product carbon footprint in materials and in body carbon. So, so looking at the materials really that the National Grid can then potentially use to update some of the assumptions that are currently in the um, tool that's been, been developed to date. So then we brought all of that together into the whole life carbon tool itself. Um, so 
as I said, its in, interface is in Excel. Um, needed to be kind of offline um, for for various reasons for ease of access and um, usability. And uh, yeah, Excel just kind of gives you that platform that everyone's very familiar with. Um, and um, as I say, easy easy to access, easy to use. Um, so it's got um, three data input tabs, I suppose, one for each um, stage of the project, outline design, detail design, and that's built. Um, and it works on a series of, kind of pop-up um, questions and drop down lists to enable users to select the assets that they um, need or assets and activities that they need to develop their product, um, add quantities, uh, change change parameters, change some of the assumptions that are included in the tool if they um, know, know more information. Uh, and then that's all kind of brought um, together in a reporting dashboard that enables users to track the performance of the project over time. So have they been able to achieve carbon reduction from outline design through to as built, um, as well as track kind of the whole life carbon impact, where the hotspots are in terms of um, kind of replacement cycles, uh, maintenance, and kind of carbon impact beyond the construction of the project itself. Um, just gives gives a bit more data in terms of being able to make those key decisions and think about um, where things can be changed to to um, achieve carbon savings, but also a space to document those carbon savings and um, learnings that, could, that can then be shared on future projects. So I guess each Excel file obviously only reports one project. Um, so alongside the Excel dashboard um, in the tools itself, we also created a Power BI dashboard that can read from, from multiple Excel files, providing an easy way for National Grid to do some company level reporting, um, both the, the requirements of Ofgem, internal sustainability reporting, comparing key projects um, and, and looking at some of those savings and design ideas together. Um, so you don't need to, to kind of switch between lots of different Excel files. Um, I guess, yeah, the, the take home, um, obviously, no matter how good the tool, um, the data sets underneath it, the key elements is, is around um, kind of embedding this into business process and policy. And um, yeah, I think Jill's gonna gonna talk about how um, what the next steps are for National Grid and uh, in terms of implementation and testing. Thanks, Hayley. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name's Jill Russell. I'm the Environment Manager here at National Grid Electricity Distribution. And yeah, so just as Hayley said, I'm just going to very briefly touch on the follow on activities and implementation of Project Alpaca within National Grid Electricity Distribution. So uh, as described, the main aim of the Alpaca tool for our businesses to develop a holistic and embedded approach to the whole life carbon management process across uh, a various, various and a number of our in-house project manage, management processes and systems, um, allowing our teams and individuals across our business to not only monitor and report the carbon impact of their own activities, um, but also to proactively manage these impacts as we plan and develop projects through to completion. However, the implementation of the tool will also support our business in the following sort of perhaps lesser obvious four key ways. So they will, it will, the tool will help us to identify our most relevant scope three emissions um, and work internally with, with ourselves and with our suppliers on carbon reduction. But it'll also help us to report against our verified 1.5 degree science-based target, which we have in place. Um, it will also help us to establish uh, a better understanding of our whole life carbon impact for our capital delivery, as Hayley mentioned, both in terms of materials, labour and plant. Um, the tool will also help us improve on uh, actually the quality and coverage of our scope three um, data, which I think is a challenge for all of us going forward. 
Um, and then also the tool will help us assist as, as we've touched on the annual carbon reporting um, via our annual environment report, which um, is a key requirement of our um, up and coming price review period, Rio ED2 and Ofgem have um, given us a key requirement of that report that it should include the development of reporting of embodied carbon amongst all BNOs and sort of strive for a collaborative approach to, towards that. Also, um, sort of throughout the next 12 months, um, we will begin um, working with our major project teams across all four of our license areas um, to trial the tool um, across the entire project life cycle. So from procurement, utilizing the supplier carbon calculator, which Hayley talked about, through to project management and onto site completion. Um, the tool also provides a great opportunity um, for us to all engage um, and all the DNOs to engage via the ENA to ensure a consistent and, as I mentioned, collaborative approach to carbon reporting across the industry and our sector. Um, so that's been a bit brief, but um, I guess finally before handing over to Steve, um, I guess just to say that in, in National Grid, we're, we're really excited about trialling the tool on our projects. Um, I've no doubt it will prove to be incredibly useful um, and in time become fully embedded as a business as usual element for the successful management of our projects in the future. So I'll now hand over to Steve Valance from uh, SPEN, who's going to take you through the issues and challenges that we face as a wider industry. Hello, hi everyone. Um, thanks, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks Jill and, and thanks Lisa for, for um, having me today. and. Uh, Given me an opportunity to be part of this project, which is which is great. Um, uh, my name is Stephen Valance. I'm a sustainability specialist in Scotch Power Energy Networks, um, and I have kind of I'm largely focused on uh, carbon emissions and uh, kind of circular practices. Um, I work across both transmission and distribution license areas, and uh, one of my key kind of responsibilities is developing effective carbon ma management strategies through through Scotch Power Energy Networks and throughout. And by extension, um, throughout the wider industry, because as Jill uh, mentioned, um, collaboration in this area is really key, and um, and you know efficiencies can really be unlocked across across all TOs and DNOs by working together on this. It's not it, it doesn't pay to be competitive in this area. Um, so uh, just to echo um, a few of Jill's uh, Jill's points. Um, I just wanted to give a wider industry view of, of whole life carbon management. Um, I'll start with some of the, the drivers. Uh, of course, uh, regulation is, is a key driver. Um, we're, we're, we're regulated by Ofgem and uh, all TO, TOs and DNOs are required to submit an, an annual environmental report. Uh, in Rio 2, one of the, the kind of major step changes in, in what we're required to report on is, is embodied carbon and also to demonstrate that we are moving towards effective carbon management. So that's, that's really a key, a key driver to, to, to start embedding whole life carbon management in our practices. Um, secondly, targets. So um, all TOs and DNOs either have or are in the process of setting science-based targets, and some have set um, net zero targets within their companies. Um, so within those, those targets, um, upstream scope three emissions associated with the supply chain are are one of the key challenge areas. It's a real challenge to kind of reduce our supply chain emissions. We're not necessarily, you know, fully in control of those emissions. And um, and effective carbon management uh, will support scope three emissions by looking at that, those kind of upstream carbon impacts associated with the infrastructure we're building. If we reduce those impacts, then we'll indirectly uh, or directly um, reduce our scope three emissions associated with supply chain. Um, another driver is just doing the right thing. So, um, you know, I think uh, there is real motivation um, within the electric network industry to to um, to drive change and to to implement effective carbon management. Um, and also, there's a, a you know, it's been known for for over a decade now um, that there's a since the infrastructure carbon review that there's a clear link to to reducing carbon and reducing cost on projects. So. It's essentially a win-win for for our businesses and and the customers we serve. Um, if we if we implement effective carbon management on the on projects, um, 
there is also another driver is the, what I call uh, the net zero infrastructure paradox. So, um, you know, I talked about net zero uh, targets and that's company targets, but of course there's there's wider net zero ambitions throughout the, com uh, the, the, the countries that we operate in. So um, there's net zero targets and we're, there's a, essentially an infrastructure paradox. We, the electrical network infrastructure is absolutely key to delivering uh, net zero. Um, we integrate renewables onto the, the network, so decarbonize energy, and we decarbonize uh, transport and heat through um, our distribution networks connecting um, EVs, uh, electric vehicle um, charging points, and for example, uh, heat, heating networks, electric heating networks. So our electrical infrastructure is key to delivering the net zero transition, but we know that we're going to have to build more in order to do that. So it's really important that we make sure that we're doing the right thing in the right way and, and really driving down the carbon impact of the infrastructure we're developing in order to support that net zero transition. So those are some of the drivers, but of course there's major challenges in whole life carbon management. Um, first and foremost is, is reporting and managing. We need, to, we need to have good data in order to make effective changes. And uh, there is a lack of, of carbon data, um, particularly in the electric industry or for electrical network specific um, uh, assets. And, and alpacas really kind of really uh, um, uh, supported some of those challenges in, in, in developing uh, you know, specific factors associated with electrical infrastructure. Um, another kind of challenge is what I've called the coastline paradox. So that's basically, uh, you know, some of you might be familiar, but it's, you know, if you think about trying to measure a coastline, um, the more you kind of, the more detail that you look at it, or the closer you get to measuring that 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 coastline, the more granular it becomes and the, the kind of longer the coastline becomes because you're looking at it um, in an increasingly kind of, um, you know, a, a, a granular way. So it, it's kind of it's not it's not a perfect um, analogy, but it is it is kind of similar within carbon management. You know, we you know if you think about the you know the carbon impact of everything that we build, you know it, you need to you need to kind of the more you look into it, the more complex it becomes. You know, you need to look at your supply chain, and then if you go to the next level, it's your supply chain, supply chain, your supply chain, supply chain, right up to individual people that are you know working on a day to day. It's very, very difficult. So you need to you need to kind of align an approach, uh, a, a, an approach which is going to drive change and set the right scope, so that again you're you're using your time effectively to to manage carbon and do so across the industry in a consistent way. So develop consistent methodologies, and all this will kind of drive meaningful change. So those are some of the challenges that we have. Um, and again, the alpaca project really bridges bridges that gap so it kind of sets the right scope and the right methodology and a consistent methodology for all all dnos uh, and potentially TOs to kind of follow that that kind of structure and across the wider industry um there's there's kind of a lots of things going on and, and and we're kind of developing our approach to to navigate some of the challenges i mentioned alpaca um, and and bridging the gap between between electrical infrastructure specific carbon factors and, 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 and an approach. Um, one of the key things for reporting embodied carbon particularly is, is just getting an understanding of, of what we're building and what we're doing. Um, you know, we all deliver infrastructure in, in, in the same way, but we have slightly different approaches. So um, one of the things that we're looking at, at doing across the industry is using existing um, reporting data, um, the regulatory, regulatory reporting data, to really understand, just ask the, the, the principal question before we even, you know, start to think about the embodied carbon of, of what we're building is just pulling together a consistent approach to, to report on what we have built. Um, and so that's where the RRP, the regulatory reporting um, uh, policies come into that and, and, and really kind of understand the data that we've got to, to build to build our understanding of just principally what we've built and then use that to then understand you know the embodied carbon of, of what what that that is um, we're also developing uh, common approaches with our supply chain and um, we're working uh, we've kind of got a, a, a collaboration project with with BIMA um, who, who represent a number of electrical um, 
uh, suppliers uh, and, and supply a lot of our, our equipment, um, electrical specific equipment to, to our networks. Um, so we're working with BIMA to really understand um, the supply chain's point of view when it comes to gathering carbon information and working to reduce the carbon impact specifically of electrical equipment and setting out kind of a, a, a or the aim is to kind of set out a, an a aligned net zero roadmap for electrical networks and electrical equipment suppliers. So we're kind of going on the journey together. And then, of course, uh, I mentioned that collaboration was is key across across the network. So um, we are we are really you know working well together in, in this space through um, the, the ENA Carbon Working Group and also the the transmission uh, rocket group, which is really looking at, at how you know effectively using our time to to work towards these key challenges. Um, you know get you know sharing carbon information, sharing our approaches, developing streamlined ways that we can report embodied carbon and, and manage whole life carbon in our projects. Because uh, as I mentioned, you know, there, there isn't really um a competitive angle to this. We all want to do the right thing in the right way. And so and so kind of collaborating on it is 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 good from from all sorts of perspectives. So um thanks for that. And that, that's uh, that's my last point. All right, um, brilliant. Thanks everyone for your um, great presentations and sharing your thoughts with us. Um, so we do have um, roughly 20 minutes for questions now, and I've got uh, quite a few good questions to, to ask now. And um, if people have more questions, please uh, feel free to submit them. So I'll just go by order they were coming in. Um, the first question is who came up with the name of our park and I think I know who answered who answered that question so it, it was Nick Devine who is attending this call um so the second question um came from Richard Helen um can alpaca be used in sensitivity and scenario analysis to explore options and hence explore financial and carbon reduction trade-offs um I um, Haley do you want to take this one or I could yeah. follow up Yep. Yeah, so I guess the tool itself hasn't been designed for, I guess what you're trying to get at is whether you can use the tool for optioneering purposes and um, explore different options, both from a financial and also low carbon point of view. At the minute, the tool is purely carbon focused, um, but it aligns very closely with another system that National Grid Energy Distribution have um, in terms of its structure. Um, aligning with the asset management system. So you could have two fairly similar reports side by side that enable you to compare cost and carbon um, together, although at the minute they are not in the same system. I guess in terms of optioneering, um, it could be done, um, but you'd probably have to have multiple versions of the tool to explore your different options. Um, but then these could be compared within the, the Power BI um, dashboard to look at some of the, the kind of carbon and um, trade-offs um, between the, the different options. Thanks, Haley. Yeah, um, just to add on it, because the, the initial goal was actually embed the tool within asset management system that we have, but unfortunately we, we were not able to do it throughout the course of the project. So if that was possible, you, you, in theory, we would be able to do the optioneering quite easily. But as um, Jill mentioned, um, uh, following the trial, we'll be looking into potentially integrating the databases within our asset management system. So hopefully it will be an easy transition. Um, OK, I'll move to another question. Um, will the bespoke carbon da data sets be visible, accessible, so that carbon tracking can be done in other system consistently through the life of the project? So I guess I'll, I'll, I'll answer that one. So it, it's so the, the tool and the databases that we have is pretty much aimed at what national grid electricity distribution have. So it, it it allows us to track, but also what um, ACOM has done, they've developed the um, databases sort of more generally and shared with um, Steve. I think Steve mentioned that in his presentation. So it's been shared through that um, route. Um, so I hope that answered that question. 
Um, can this tool be applied to flexibility services you commission? Um, no. So the, the, the aim of this tool is our capital delivery. So the flexibility services are, are not really in scope, but I, um, uh, I think the Open Networks project um, touched on that <clears throat> issue. So if uh, uh, whoever's answered that question might um, need to look into that project. Yeah, Lisa, I can, if you want, I can. Sure. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, there is a carbon methodology or carbon reporting methodology being developed as part of the the flexibility um, work stream. So yeah, that's going to be, there is going to be a, a methodology specifically for flexibility services developed and there is, a, we're, we're currently piloting a carbon tool for that. So yeah, that's kind of slightly separate. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Um, so there is a question from Gareth Wood. Are there templates, list of supply data requirements available to share with supplier business to ensure they have time to prepare to prepare data for alpaca rollout? Um, Jill, do you want to take this one or do you want me to, to answer that one? Um, I, I, yeah, I guess there will be templates that we can share with suppliers. We're certainly going out there at the moment and requesting that data. Um, I, I don't know if you've got any further details to add to that, Lisa, but... Yeah, what, what I was yeah. going to say is, because we've prepared the draft, but I guess what we don't want to do to impose anything. So we are very much looking for feedback. And what, what Steve was saying, there were quite a lot of engagement that Spen has done through... Um, Beamer consultations and things, mm -hmm. and we were part of that as well. So um, it's, it's it's through the trial. What we're hoping to get is the feedback, I suppose, from our suppliers, what they're ready for at the moment, and just to see what we are aiming for as a business. And hopefully, they'll be able to supply that data that we're required to do our reporting as well. Um, I don't know, Steve. Do you have anything to add or? Um, not really on that, that specific, okay. yeah. Um, okay, so there is a question from Hall uh, Richard Helen again. What are the likely leading applications for alpaca? Is it the low hanging fruit? I don't know whether um, anyone is, um, wants to take this one. I mean, I guess that the, um, the aim of the tool was to identify the hotspots within both capital and operational delivery for a project. So I guess it gives you the opportunity to kind of have those conversations with some data to back it up. Um, so whilst the tool itself at the minute doesn't kind of jump up and tell you what the low hanging fruit is and the, well, in terms of the carbon reduction opportunity, it gives you the information to have those conversations. And I guess part of kind of the pilot and um, kind of ongoing interaction within National Grid and the design teams will be to start kind of flagging some of those opportunities and um, then new options and new um, new types of materials and things can then be added to the database and um, presented as, as alternatives, I suppose. Okay, thank you. Um, um, a question from Andrew. Um, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, and it's question about losses. Um, so as a as a key factor in our uh, carbon emissions, um, do we have a rough feel for how carbon emissions due to losses compare magnitude to the emissions associated with running the DNO business that you're covering here in the assessment tool? Um, um, Jill, would you be the, the best person to, to take this one? Yeah, we, we do monitor our losses and we report on those annually. Um, and yeah, of course, our network line losses are, uh, are, are significant, obviously, in comparison to sort of any carbon that's going to be um, identified and, and managed via um, the alpaca tool. Um, but notwithstanding that, I, I think the alpaca tool is really important to move forward and trial. Um, especially for, you know, kind of understanding those scope three emissions and our science-based targets. Thank you. Um, so um, there is an inquiry from Scott Bowell, um, whether the tool will be published and whether there will be any KPIs or tender awakening associated with it. Um, I I mean, if, if I try probably to, to take this one, um, again, you 
it it is just being developed and it does require um testing so that's what Joe was saying we do want to test it more widely across the business and th with our suppliers and we're very much open to feedback so um we, i guess we we just want to refine it so that everyone is comfortable using that we have a good guidance what's required before um, rolling it out widely um so um a next question from pete mash um uh, national grid are in the process of changing their asset management system throughout the uk and us how will this work with that i can't um possibly comment on that i, I wasn't aware of that process so if, do, like, do you know anything about this I'm afraid not. No, that's um, that's news to me. <laughs> yeah, sorry. We might need to um, ask around what 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 is um, happening. Um, um, next question: um, As a bespoke system, how will National Group continue to maintain and grow this system in order to cope with the rapid changes that are going on the um, ESG area arena? Um, I don't know, Jill, would that be for you again? Yeah, I, I obviously sort of the whole area around ESG governance and assurance. Um, but kind of we've got to start somewhere, I guess, and we're going to learn an awful lot from, from the trials and how the tool develops over the course of ED2. I think I think sort of there's almost a, an evolution there that the tool will evolve, in, evolve and develop in line kind of we're going to have to make sure it's in line with those ongoing ESG um, requirements um, so it's 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 got to be quite sort of uh, flexible and it's got to kind of cope with that transition as well so if that if that sort of makes sense it's kind of up to us I guess to make sure it's it can um, sort of feed into those ESG requirements moving forward thank you um Will National Grid go out to tender on this, or will it um, will it not meet the government requirements for FTS rules? Um, Jill, I I don't know. Would that be you? I don't I don't know how to answer I'm that not sure question. I can answer that one. I don't. I know. guess with, with respect to tender again, it just we are at the testing mode for for this tool, so it's not going to be used for tenders yet. So. Um, national grid transmission do you use that tool for tenders for capital delivery as far as i'm aware but we are kind of at the stage where we're just in, in in development mode and testing mode at this particular moment of time um i've got two more questions um will reduce carbon impact be taken into account in tenders oh again sorry construction may be more expensive but deliver lower carbon impact across the life of the asset so I think this tool is trying to recognize it that, um, so we're, we're trying, this is why it's sort of whole life carbon tool, at least the aim of it, so that we could understand the whole life carbon impact of a particular, of our major schemes. Um, and the last question that I have is, uh, how will the tool publish data out? Is it a part of the government open data program? So no it's it's the internal tool for now and um um like i like i mentioned before um, um some of the databases specifically material databases have been shared with um ena working group for consideration so they will be evaluating whether it's applicable um for for all dnos and how to take it forward um there are uh, as far as i'm aware maybe steve you you um I could jump on this one there'll be f further work through ena yeah i think so yeah i think um i suppose i don't know what national grid's plans are to to report the annual environmental report and so that i guess it would potentially become publicly available but to my knowledge it's not part of the government open data program um or at least not for a while yeah thanks steve um um, so another question came in just now um, from Janet Wood. Um, you did not include end of life because of the long lifetime of some assets. Is there any route to incorporate this for the shorter lived smaller components? Um, 
Haley, would do you want to take this one? Um, so obviously we for the short lived kind of small well, for the key key components we have considered replacement cycles and things like that. Um, in terms of the end of life component and the emissions associated with them, you have to draw the line somewhere. So we've included um, the the transportation or um, the delivery of the new um, replacement piece of kit and um, removal of that piece of kit. I guess in terms of the disposal, um, at the minute the government um, emission factors for recycling um, of products only include that transportation element between um, the, the site that it's taken from um, through to the waste disposal facility. So we have captured some element of transportation. Um, we then felt that any kind of new new products or the recycling of products and kind of the circular economy of that nature would be incorporated into the next stage of, of, of a new project. So whether that's National Grid or whether that's um, another organisation using this recycled material, the emissions of that product would be um, captured within the capital and embodied carbon upfront. Thank you. I think we'll take one last question and um, we'll, we'll close. Um, who do you expect will be the main user of this tool um, sort of in the immediate future and looking to the future? Um, if, I, if I try to answer, so there are three key stages that the tool takes the user through. So it's a planning stage, um, detailed design and as built stage, which allows you to hopefully track the difference that um, changes in design could reduce carbon and at the as build stage maybe there are opportunities to reduce carbon there so at the planning stage you'll be our planners who use the tool initially and as i mentioned before if it's integrated within asset management system it will be quite an easy uh, task because it will be um uh, potentially could it be done at the costing stage as well well, so the as design stage, it, it goes into uh, more detail, be our um, designers. And then at the planning stage, as Joe was saying, um, when we're testing it with our major projects team, it will be project managers who will be potentially responsible for using the tool and providing the outputs um, to us. So it's very much for now internally facing tool. Um, but again, um, following the testing, um, period there might be some tweaks to it um jill would would you add anything or you roughly agree with me i wholeheartedly agree um I, I think kind of that's the whole purpose of the trial isn't it in the testing just to to see um you know fit for purpose and any sort of uh, amendments that can be made that then can kind of capture and improve on the system so yeah it's all good Brilliant. All right. Thank you. And I, I think um, we'll close there. And just to say that um, um, thanks very much for joining us today. Thank you for your um, questions. This webinar will be is recorded and will be shared on our website. And uh, we are quite open for feedback. So if you have any thoughts, um, ideas or comments on what we've done and how we've done it, uh, please get in touch through our mailbox It's um, and get innovation. Um, mailbox um so yeah thanks again and um bye for now thanks everyone